Okay, well, uh, good afternoon. I'm so happy to start this panel and to share well panel with experts like Professor Francis, with Liz, with Ruti as well. Now we are going to talk about the relation between arts and human rights. And before that, I just would like to say thank you very much to the Institute of the Study of Human Rights at Columbia University and to the Age Wrap Program, Human Rights Advocates Program, in which I am participating during the last eight months. Uh, I'm Alejandro Pinilla, I'm from Colombia. I'm a journalist working like during the last five years trying to make connections between arts and human rights. So this is what I'm so excited to, to start this conversation. How does the art affect humanity and human rights? Does it play an important role uh, in human rights advocacy? Throughout the history, people have used the arts as a form of uh, self-expression uh, by reflecting on their lives and what they observe. Art and design are constantly changing and growing with history. And it is constantly being influenced while influencing uh, events in the society. The vision from artists, curators, scholars, and human rights practitioners explore the links between artists' practice and human rights in the context of a world which has been changing uh, quickly as well. So the relation between human rights and the art is not obvious all the time. Human rights are commonly understood as a set of internationally agreed norms and standards covering economic, social, cultural, civil, and political rights. But human rights are more than a legal instrument. They are a powerful moral notion associated with the idea of human dignity and this is why they are capable of stimulating artists and the common citizens alike. So I would like to propose for this panel a dialogue to articulate and debate essential questions about the relation between arts and human rights, discuss models of collaboration between arts and human rights actors, and also explore the role arts may play to restrain or violate rights and how to tackle such concerns. I would like to start this conversation with Professor Francis Negron Montaner. Uh, I'm so happy to share this panel with you. I'm actually I'm taking her class at Columbia University Videos Inquiry. And I will say that it's a very interesting class. Uh, and from my opinion, we have been talking about those discussions like every week from different perspectives. Uh, well, Professor Francis uh, has an MA in Visual Anthropology and Masters in Fine Arts, Temple PhD in Comparative Literature at Rutgers. Uh, Professor Francis is an award-winning filmmaker, writer, and scholar. She is a recipient at four Truman Scripps Howard uh, Rockefeller and Pew Fellowships, as well as Social Science Research Council and, and the Warhol uh, Foundation grants. Professor Francis, Valori Cambio is a storytelling, community building, and solidarity economy project started by you and the visual artist Sarbel Santos Negron. If I understood correctly, the project has encouraged participants to consider the question on, on how a community can create different conceptions of wealth, uh, one that promotes values such as accessible education, a clean environment, self-governance, solidarity, food security, and the gender, labor, and racial equity. So please, let us know a little bit more about the project and your perspective as well. That how you have been working on human rights and, and arts at the same time. What is your vision on, on this? The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Daniel, for inviting me um, and for entering into dialogue with everyone here today. Um, as I mentioned to Daniel early on, uh, my work doesn't necessarily use the framework of human rights. However, the, the questions that it raises and the practices that it um, has made possible, I think, uh, overlap considerably with the questions that are that you presented earlier. So I'm going to uh, share my screen uh, because it'll be much easier to explain what I'm talking about when we talk about Valori Cambio by um, showing it. Um, so the project that I'm gonna start talking about and then I'm gonna link it to another project that I'm working on, conceptual project, uh, is called Valori Cambio, Value and Change. And it was piloted in Puerto Rico um, uh, as you know, Puerto Rico is a, a U.S. Uh, is under U.S. colonial uh, capitalist rule since 1898, and since um, 
2006, at least, has been subject to a new form of coloniality that we could call neoliberal coloniality. And um, I define Valori Cambio differently in different contexts, but for today, let's call it an interactive installation that combines art, storytelling, and just economy principles to facilitate a conversation of what we mean by the economy. The main goals of the project when we started was to provide a platform for people to consider what they value. Experience a non-extractive exchange economy and introduce the notion of community currency, which in this case uh, we called personas de peso Puerto Rico, but people generally called it just pesos, given that that's how even the dollar is often uh, described. A community currency is a type of non-market money that is created and adopted by groups to value collective skills, knowledge, and talents and facilitates their exchange. In general, in most contexts, they do not replace the national or the dominant currency, but are used to strengthen local activity and build economies that are not based on profit or accumulation. Uh, often people are surprised to know that there are thousands of community currencies in circulation in the world. This is one from Basque Country. Uh, this is one from Brazil. And of course, one of the most famous historically is the Ithaca Hours, no longer in circulation, but that operated for decades uh, in Ithaca, New York. The need for our project came from the intensification of suffering in Puerto Rico uh, as global capital, as a result of global capital, a US interest devising new mechanisms to extract even more exorbitant profits from the island. In 2016, a year after the governor of Puerto Rico announced that the island's government amassed a public debt of $72 billion and that this debt, in addition to 50 billion in pension obligation was quote unquote unpayable the U.S. responded by passing the Oversight Management and Economic Stability Act, sometimes called PROMESA, which returned Puerto Rico to a direct form of colonial rule. This federal law created a fiscal control board involved in producing the crisis, I mean, including members that were directly involved in producing the crisis and granted this body broad powers to extract payment by privatization and cuts to all of life fundamentals, including health, education, infrastructure, and pensions. These trends uh, accelerated after September 16, 2017, when a massive Category 5 hurricane in Maria destroyed the archipelago's deteriorated infrastructure, including electric, leaving half a million residents with damaged or destroyed homes and an electricity blackout that lasted a year. This also ushered what we can name disaster capitalism and a calculated micropolitics by the federal and island governments that resulted in hunger, homelessness, and the death of at least 4,645 people, as well as the migration of over 100,000 residents at the time, 4% of the population to US cities. Poverty rates also rose to 50% of the population. Such pain led me to ask myself many questions that I had not considered before as a humanity scholar. One of them was, what is money? How does it acquire value? Can it be a disruptive tool or, or only an extractive tool? These questions led me to this project, which was my first public art project, although I've made a number of films before. It was the first time that I took the project outside, if you will. To set the project in motion, I collaborated with visual artist Sarabe Santos Negron, as Daniel mentioned, to design a series of six, six banknotes, ranging from one to 25 pesos, that feature images of Puerto Rican historical figures and an iconic community. Together with a team of designers, computer engineers, and solidarity economy advocates, we reconfigured a donated ATM machine, which we renamed the VIC, acronym for value and change, to record people's stories and dispense the bills. And the way the project worked was to obtain a bill, you had to approach the ATM and answer several questions about value. What did you value? What are the, um, what are the obstacles to what you value be enacted and who uh, or what institutions already do what you value. In exchange of those stories, the, the ATM gave you a bill um, and the bills contain stories of uh, what was uh, on the uh, face of the bill that you could access through a, a QR code in the back. Over 42 businesses and organizations came to accept the bill during the project. Uh, in exchange for us telling their stories in social media. So basically what we created with the project was a site where the uh, main unit of value 
was storytelling. Starting on February 9, and over the course of eight days, the project visited five locations, two public schools, and a youth program. And from the very first day, the test day in the Aberdura restaurant in Old San Juan, the response to the project surprised everyone. Hundreds of participants stood in line every day for hours until evening, rain or shine, to obtain one of these bills. A number of people came every day and others every time they could. On the last day of the project, the big was open for 14 hours until midnight to honor the petition of people who worked as cooks, waiters, and bartenders in the area to participate in the project after their shifts ended. Immediately, the response begged the question. Since this line wasn't to obtain fuel, a job, or even a concert ticket, why were they there? What made this wait worth, worth it? And the most striking thing in a country that was suffering uh, such uh, lack and, and poverty rates uh, was it wasn't for the money. At least not for the exchange value of the bills. Of the thousands of people who participated and thousands of bills that circulated, which were thousands of dollars, less than 100 bills totaling 150 pesos were actually used for exchange. That the majority of people opted to keep the bills may appear as a form of hoarding, but we discovered that the politics of keeping the money was much more complex. I started asking people every day, why were they keeping the money? And they said many things. They said they retained the pesos because the bills represented works of art and both the project and the bills were beautiful because the bills affirmed their identities or represented a new beginning. In this regard, the bills were a signifier of hope for a more just, inclusive, and equitable Puerto Rico. Moreover, we have to remember that Puerto Rico has been a colony for its entire modern history, first under Spain and, and for the last 120 plus years under the US, and during the entire time has never been able to have a national currency. And in, in not having a currency or using the currency of another country or a colonial power, is not only what people were responding to, although that is significant, it was also that the bills of the US currency themselves enshrined what we can call the coloniality of power, defined by Nelson Maldonado Torres as the longstanding patterns of power that define culture, labor, intersubjective relations, and knowledge production beyond the limits of colonial administrations. And just looking at a comparison between the stories that our bills told and the stories that the US dollar tells might be instructive. In this regard, the idea of a local currency created for communal well being, which circulates images and stories of women, Blacks, Puerto Ricans, migrants, and children of immigrants, writers, doctors, educators, athletes, thinkers, feminists, union organizers, individuals, but also families and communities was challenging the ways that the US currency was discounting people, Puerto Ricans every day. So to rejoice at this currency was to challenge the mul multiple layers of dispossession, material, symbolic, and so forth. The peso was then a piece of each participant's personal and collective history that they refused to part or transact with. The project surprised us also in another way. It brought us, it brought people, participants, and us tremendous joy. And in trying to understand this joy, I proposed an, a, a new concept called the colonial joy. Day after day, I noticed that joy generally appeared when participants received the bills, particularly when they obtained the figure they were hoping for. One of the most compelling examples of this was that of a young artist and teacher, Eduardo Paz who made the line for hours for several days because he wanted to receive one particular bill. The one featuring the Cordero siblings, pioneers of public education in the 18th and 19th century. When he finally did on February 18, I asked Paz why this bill brought him so much joy. Basically he said, the bill represents who I am, an Afro-descendant man fighting educating and showing the roots to the different situations that life can present. This bill is worth a lot. At times I distrust, I distrust this joy, mine and others. All joy is not good or means good. 
you can rejoice at another's misfortune or take pleasure in it. Yet during Valoricambio, joy appeared at the precise moment when many, myself included, felt this possibility of a different now, one where neither colonialism nor coloniality ruled over our lives. In this, joy is thoroughly political. A scholar, Miroslav Volf, has noted, joy sets itself tacitly against features of the world of which, which we cannot or should not rejoice, which is perhaps why this joy was somewhat contagious in the, pro in the project, leading to another unexpected outcome, the immediate emergence of community currencies and solidarity projects. One is taking place in El Caño Martin Peña, a month before the big touched the ground, I had visited El Caño Martin Peña to ask permission to tell their story in the 25 bill. After a brief conversation, they proposed that we bring the project to their community farmers market, which we did. And less than a year uh, after our project uh, moved to New York, El Caño launched its Tienda Solidaria on Puerto Rico's first community currency as we define it in this project, the Pasos or Steps del Caño Martin Peña. And they named their, their currency pasos uh, because they were either used and circulated to recognize people in the community whose actions bring the community closer, a step closer to their goals. Of course, in our project, not everything was joyful. Uh, the fact that uh, the, the project was greeted by Joe is directly related to the sufferings of austerity, Maria and mass migration. You cannot separate the two. Also, while joy was widely shared and collectively experienced by participants, what made people joyful was often different, leading to some conflicts. For instance, a small number of people who participated in the project did so apparently with the main objectives of cashing in on the colonial joy. Uh, not surprisingly, in less than 48 hours, at least two people were selling the pesos on the eBay platform for as much as $125, leading to intense arguments. Joe was likely not the only response to the project. Comments in relation to the two most visible press and broadcast items about the project in the press showed that conservatives did not experience the colonial joy, but what you can call colonial capitalist disgust. Of the hundreds, 400 at least, comments left on El Nuevo Día and Telemundo's website under Valoricambio coverage, the overwhelming majority of them were insults to the artist mockery at the idea that Puerto Rico could ever have a valuable currency or have a thriving economy without the United States. Yet, although there were some questions and challenges during, during our project, I now see Valori Cambio as part of a broader set of transformations in the relationship between art and politics in Puerto Rico, where art has come to play major roles in contesting, rebuilding, and re reinventing infrastructure. And I want to conclude with the uh, new work that I'm work uh, that I'm doing, uh, a piece called "The Arts of Catastrophe" that will be appearing in Arts Margin uh, this year. So this concept, arts of catastrophe, I'm defining as the ways that people, communities, and networks take up the project of life in the ruins of disaster, defining disaster as the alignment of circumstances that leads to devastation of life, places, and relations. Since I started to think about it in relation to Valori Cambio and to the place of the arts in this context, I tend to use the term in two overlapping but not identical ways. So we have art of catastrophe, which would be the particularly artistic practices and methods uh, that come to uh, repair or make up for destroyed, discontinued, or devious uh, dañino infrastructure in the context of colonial disaster. Um, but also, more generally, the art of catastrophe, which is the knowledge, the wide range and forms of knowledge that have come to include centrally the arts, but that are not only the arts. In, in each case, neither concept refers to an object or a thing, but materialize relations, counter narratives, pedagogies, strategies, and aspirations. Now, I, I'm showing you several uh, ways that these arts of catastrophe uh, that I will explore in my piece. This is the Cine Solar in Adjuntas, uh, Casa Pueblo, which uses, uh, which is uh, exactly that, a solar system, uh, a solar powered uh, cinema that shows independent work, but also aims to create uh, sub, uh, solar citizens, if you will, uh, to transition to other forms of, of, of uh, electricity. Um, these uh, this, uh, two pieces are part of the uh, uh, murals 
that have been in place for now uh, as ways to ward off or limit uh, speculation um, in the area. Uh, and also uh, this example uh, uh, image by Huascar Robles, uh, another important uh, function that the arts have taken in Puerto Rico as arts of catastrophe has been that of documentation and archiving, including memorialization of the dead refused by the state. Uh, all, um, finally, I do not use the, I wanna underscore that I do not use the concept of catastrophe as equivalent to disaster. Rather, I'm building on the work of literary scholar Alexandra Parisic and her observation that catastrophe, a term that derives from the Greek meaning to overturn, can be understood not as disaster, but as a moment of overturning in which collective praxis is possible. In other words, I think the arts of catastrophe, including Valori Cambio, are effective in part because uh, they have that impact of overturning rather than um, simply critique or, um, or other forms of pol politics that it could take. In contrast to the increasingly subscribed collapse of civilization narrative in the context of climate change, at catastrophic praxis, the NOS assumed that disaster would lead to a completely fatal end. Instead, it suggests that new forms of knowledge and action may emerge by turning disaster into catastrophe. So by emphasizing catastrophe, I do not deny the possibility of collapse or, or deadly disaster, but that to, to, to suggest that to act catastrophically is a specific political project in the face of disaster and not the same. Thank you so much. I look forward to the conversation. Well, Professor Francis, thank you so much for letting us know about those incredible initiative, about uh, Cambio and the arts of the catastrophe. Uh, many thoughts in my mind right now, but maybe we can talk about this later. I would like to invite now um, Ruti Title, which is an internationally recognized uh, is, is internationally recognized as an authority on international law, international human rights, international uh, transitional justice, and comparative constitutional law as well. It's an honor, Ruti, to share this panel with you. Uh, Ruti is the Ernst C. Stiefel Professor of Comparative Law at New York Law School co-director of the Center for International Law and director of the Institute for Global Law, Justice and Policy. She was a Strauss Fellow at New York University Law School's Strauss Institute for the Advanced Study of Law and Justice. Well, Ruti, how to recon with the past? Transitional justice is an interdisciplinary effort connecting law, philosophy, and politics in order to grapple with the dilemmas of post a uh, communist and authorization, uh, uh, authoritarian transitions. So I know that you have been focused on transitional justice and the human size of the globalization. I really would like to know more about your vision about how we can, how we can combine both human rights and, and international law and international human rights. So Valerie too, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. Gracias, Daniel, and to the rest of the panel. Uh, it's an opportunity to continue our conversations, is how Daniel put it. So I'm, I'm going to be speaking in that spirit. Uh, and I want to share uh, with you an interdisciplinary conversation that began about 20 years ago with the late uh, Okwi Enwazor, who was a political theorist and a curator a leading curator. He was the curator of Documenta 11, which uh, brought me into the conversation uh, just before 9-11 uh, on issues of transitional justice, which he was uh, working on then. And then uh, later on, uh, he um, you know, was working on issues of racial justice and, and we stayed in that conversation. So I wanna share um, some thoughts about um, that collaboration and a little bit about the impact uh, for me uh, in my practices. Um, and, 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 you know, I, ha I have to say at the start that I'm not uh, like Francis who spoke before, uh, you know, producing uh, artwork, but I am in collaboration and in, in an interdisciplinary conversations uh, with, uh, with artists and have um, participated in a number of, of uh, platforms. And, and, and Okwi really opened the door for me in this regard. So uh, my meeting with the Okwi and Wazor came on the occasion of participation in Documenta 11, which you may know is one of the leading contemporary art shows in the world. 
And it was to join him and other uh, artists, theorists, uh, philosophers um, uh, before the art show in Kassel at what he called a series of discursive openings. He, he really you know, was the first that I know of that used the word platform in this regard. Now we use it on the internet in, in quite a different way. And, and he proposed this idea of that uh, he would, we would go to global cities, uh, Berlin, St. Lucia. Uh, I was invited to New Delhi, New York. Uh, and we would have uh, these conversations with, uh, as jumping off points for engaging later with the visual work in Kassel. Uh, and so that uh, began the conversation. The, the platform I was invited to in New Delhi was entitled Platform 2, a quote unquote experiments with truth which uh, later became the subject of a book to which I contributed a chapter. And that, that uh, be, began really a journey, a journey all the, you know, as far away as India, but many came from, um, from London and New York. And, um, <clears throat> and, uh, and so that was uh, the beginning of the conversation. I'll be sharing screen in a little bit. I'm not uh, using it right now. Right now I'm just uh, uh, talking. In any event, uh, when Oakley reached out to me, um, he had read my book, Transitional Justice, and he uh, said that this was going to be the subject of the platform in New Delhi, that he wanted to situate a conversation about reckoning with the past, with issues of justice and truth in India. Uh, and uh, it's a place where the uh, transitional reckoning between India uh, and Pakistan and the Brits had never really happened. And he wanted to, uh, to use that as the setting, but then of course, to speak more broadly about issues of political transition. And so how to reckon with the past uh, was uh, the question that Daniel started with. And Documenta began with this idea of extraterritoriality. The idea was to displace the historical context in Kessel you know, moving it out of Germany, moving it out of the domain of the gallery to the discursive. And thirdly, by expanding the focus of disciplinary models, uh, he was uh, keen to uh, destabilize uh, the disciplinary approaches to these issues, which was very welcome to me. I think I was the only lawyer <laughs> at that conference. There was um, a theorist uh, a professor from Columbia University, Mahmoud Mamdani, whom I'm sure you know, has worked on issues regarding Rwanda, Uganda, et cetera. So we well, actually were on the panel, the same panel on transitional justice. In any event, the curatorial team had already been steeped in critical reflection, but 9-11 also struck the group. And that really well, was a provoc an, ex an additional provocation about you know, bringing uh, the issues of, of uh, neoliberal globalization very clearly uh, uh, to the group. Um, now in Oakley's words, the platforms in New Delhi, which were called Reckoning with Truth, he saw them as quote, a constellation of disciplinary models that seek to explain and interrogate ongoing historical processes and radical change. Spatial and temporal dynamics, as well as fields of action and ideas and systems of interpretation and production. And you can see this huge ambition and the valence of the project. Um, the platforms conceptualized themes in glo globalism that were salient at the time. We were, it was the time of millennial transition, which many, you know, some would uh, characterize as triumphalism, right? Uh, end of history and others as, um, as uh, uh, apocalyptic. Uh, and so the platform, platform one was on democracy in relation to history. Um, uh, our platform, Reconciliation in Connection with Justice, uh, the one in St. Lucia, Cultural Hybridity, uh, and then uh, issues of urbanization and millennial stresses. From the outset, the project was conceived not as an exhibition, but as a constellation of public spheres. And, and the, you know, so he really um, problematized that idea of the arts only as visual. There was a lot of video uh, at, in our platform and in the ultimate uh, documenta 2011. Um, uh, most of the artists were mixed media. Um, and, and so he was really grappling with the way these issues of justice arise in what he would call deterritorialized sites. 
And there was really no agenda when we got to India, you know, being a lawyer and a kind of you know, organized, trying to be an organized person. I asked, like, is there an agenda, an outline, a program, something, syllabus? Uh, he says, no, that, the, that this would come out of this mix of curators, academics, artists, writers, and, and that the problem of justice which, which many uh, lawyers and theorists see as static and idealized, this would become thoroughly interrogated through this interdisciplinary conversation. Anyway, it was great. It really um, was an opening for me, uh, taught me how to see uh, or see better. Uh, and, and, uh, and not only were we looking at the transitional issues in India, of course, but rather, you know, he, because he brought uh, um, uh, uh, practicing artists and uh, theorists from all over the world. It was a sober reflection on other complex conflicts of an ethnic, racial, religious, and sectarian uh, basis. And so that was the scope of that platform. Um, I, uh, you know, be became aware of artists working in this mixed media way. Uh, William Kentridge, who was uh, uh, very active at that time, working on um, uh, responses to apartheid. Um, from the region, there were artists that were working uh, on the legacy of Mahatma Gandhi and the Indian movement of nonviolence and the, le you know, the legacy of that, um, you know, which obviously has ha had a huge impact in the United States during the civil rights period. Um, I spent a lot of time in the platform viewing films and it was very interesting to me you know, Daniel raised this at the start, that would be the uh, similarities and affinities between these art films that were grappling with issues of human rights violations and, and what we might call human rights films, um, you know, up front and, and, and what is the difference or, or uh, uh, there. Now, um, uh, my own contribution uh, in that platform and the book is called Reckoning with, with Truth was really what kind of truth is necessary for societies to uh, uh, pursue justice. And, and I came away with the, the view that these were not foundational truths, but rather micro truths. That's what I wrote about there was that these were truths that uh, could become available and were important to, to displace the master narratives of, uh, that were often nationalist propaganda, those of us from Latin America and, and the Caribbean know uh, these, you know, certainly in my home country, I should have started with this is Argentina. And that uh, brought me into the issues of transitional justice. And there certainly was a master narrative to destabilize there. Upon further reflection after that, that platform, um, what, what became um, important to me, and I saw that, you know, in reflecting on Oakley's work, and, by, and these remarks uh, are, um, uh, are the subject of a publication online now. Uh, to honor his death um, and 20 years from Documento, there's now Platform 6. And so that's um, uh, where these, these ideas are more elaborated. It struck me that uh, part of what we're talking about here is the pursuit of an opening, an apertura. Uh, Francis talked about rupture. And, and uh, the philosopher Carlos Nino in Argentina talked about the trials this way, what are known as the human rights trials in Argentina, not necessarily for a master narrative, but rather to open up the glimpse of what he called the epistemic uh, decision making of a closed elite. So, you know, I, I feel like there are, you know, themes that come out of, of our uh, talks today. I explored these in my contribution, as I mentioned, to this new uh, platform in Oakley's honor. Um, and then the other uh, themes were uh, about globalization. These have stuck with me. Um, my second book on transitional justice, which was impacted hugely by Oakley's practices and by his method and part of what I, I learned there was to see uh, transitional justice in a global way, beyond the transition and beyond the state. Not necessarily something I advocate, but certainly something that had emerged uh, during those last uh, 10, 15 years of the creation of the, of the field. Um, and so that uh, is, is subject of, you know, also something we could uh, pursue. Um, to, to wind up and, and put up some slides, the last project that Oakley and his team, and I must mention Mark Nash, 
uh, Steve McQueen, uh, Carlos Basualdo, Utameta Bear, they're all working and part of the legacy of Oquien Resort. And they put on a show uh, a year ago that was um, a, a, a kind of a brainchild of Oquien, which was bringing these issues home to the United States. And it was called Grief and Grievance. Uh, uh, it was at the New Museum. I hope uh, uh, folks caught it. And it was really about this question of the, of the artwork that uh, African-American artists are doing in the United States um, and how they're processing uh, the injustices and the human rights violations and, and, and how they are mourning, mourning work. And there's kind of a German word, right? Trauerarbeit for this. And, and Oakley called it that. And he invoked also a discursive element of the Lincoln's Gettysburg Address which could be seen as ironic, but also a theme of, uh, you know, he, the theme of emancipation and of freedom is in every room of that art show. So that's, uh, you know, no, interesting. Let, three minutes. And so now I'm going to share the screen just to show uh, three, four slides. Okay. So um, this is, uh, um, do you see? Uh, yeah. Um, Ken Tridge, that's on the cover of my book, The Blue Head, which is both African and global, the fissures, the fissures of globalization he has over, over that grid. And also this uh, was um, also Ken Tridge uh, from a video uh, that uh, show uh, that he had at the MoMA. And it's from, it's called The Refusal of Time. Uh, and that's on my second book, which reflected the impact of, of William Kentridge by the way, who comes from a family of six generations of lawyers in South Africa and switched to other media, okay? So, and then um, uh, from the Grief and Grievance show, Mark Bradford, Mark Bradford's Untitled. Uh, he was the uh, representative for the United States. Obama picked him, a uh, Los Angeles artist working on these issues in his collage paintings, in his collage paintings, um, uh, to address issues of violence in the United States. And this is the Watts Rebellion, a very haunting and moving piece. Uh, this is Julie Moretu also in the show, and this is Mogama, and it's a uh, three part on um, transitions in the Arab world, the Arab Spring. And you can see she's working uh, on Tahrir Square and shows the changes there. Her work is also very layered, uh, takes up issues of time, uh, and, uh, and geography and where does transition occur in these lim liminal spaces. Uh, lastly, and most haunting, this is from a show that's on now at the Whitney, Jennifer Packer, uh, this is The Body Has Memory. Uh, and it's uh, a show that's incredible. And it's about uh, the work of this, this, uh, of the current moment and the racial violence in the current moment. It's more figurative than the other pieces which are more abstract in their form of representation. So I just wanted to share, my time is up and uh, thank you to Daniel and uh, the others for an opportunity to uh, a dialogue. Yeah. No, thank you, Ruti. It was an impressive presentation and I knew it from the beginning that uh, it will be very rich in terms of new perspective to this dialogue, which is increasing every day. Now I would like to pass to, to Luis who is a Brooklyn-based multidisciplinary artist. He's receiving his, he received his BFA in photography and contemporary creation at IDEP in Barcelona in 2012. He primarily works using the different discipline of photography, but also works with video to explore the obscurities of human activity and the space in which we inhabit. His work has been exhibited in New York, Miami, Virginia, Buenos Aires, Guatemala City, Barcelona, Bilbao, Hiroshima, and Sydney. Well, Luis, uh, in April 1996, your father and you were abducted from your home and held captive for 33 days by an organized crime group known as Los Pasaco. In the early 90s, Los Pasaco were the most feared and notorious group of criminals in Guatemala. So PASACO 19, uh, 1996 is the, an investigative project uh, photography that revises uh, that moment. The project contains a uh, recuperated documents media of the time, as well as new documentation of locations, people and objects that took 
uh, that took place and part in the act. So if I understood correctly, the main objective of this project is to start conversations surrounding the, the story, those of violence, corruption, uh, capital punishment and criminal rehabilitation. So Luis, I would like to learn more about this story and your perspective as an artist, how you can combine both art and human rights and what kind of conversations would you like to promote from your, your current work? Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me, first of all. Um, <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, um, to summarize, um, my father and I got uh, kidnapped in, in 96 and um, for as long as I can remember, I remember I, as in, I was going to explore this in the artistic practice at some point in my life in some way. And it, it took many attempts, many years to really concrete uh, the path that I wanted to take. Initially, um, I started exploring the more um, personal side of traumas and all these things, but I wasn't, it didn't convince me. I th thought it was more important to talk about uh, broader issues. Um, so then in around 2018, I started um, working on this project, um, invest, uh, doing research and, and, and finding out the perfect uh, path to do it. And so I chose to go to Guatemala and kind of go to all these different places and meet up with different people that, that took part in this act. So I, I found, for example, um, one of the homes in which we were kept in, in Guatemala City. And I met up with a, an advisor from the government that was appointed to, for us to help us with negotiations and all these things. Um, so all these things I, I started documenting. And as, Daniel mentions it, it. I look to to talk about different um, subjects, which is violence in in Guatemala and in surrounding countries, and and corruption and capital punishment and criminal rehabilitation. Um, for the purpose of this um, conversation, I want to um, more just um, direct on the capital punishment and criminal rehabilitation uh, aspect of it. And something that I stand very against is uh, capital punishment, uh, death penalty. And during the trial, which was in 1998 for this abduction, um, I was eight years old, so I didn't have too much say in it. But um, five of the, of the abductors were sentenced to death. And that's kind of where I... I knew the story uh, stayed, you know, I, I, for my whole life, I lived thinking of um, these five people that were killed. Um, when I get to Guatemala and I start working on this project, I find out that that wasn't the case. They, re they appealed the trial and they got instead sentenced to 50 years. So it was such a change in my, like, perspective of it like oh okay so they didn't end up dying you know uh, and that was very eye-opening and I started kind of exploring that uh, aspect of it and it's it's just a, a difficult place because a lot of people in Guatemala are in favor of capital punishment because they are so um, just tired of, of, of all these crimes and all these things and think that's kind of the only solution um, also because the 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 jail system in Guatemala is not too secure. So a lot of the um, criminals end up escaping and continuing their, their, their um, work <laughs> as criminals. Um, so it's, it's a very tricky situation. And, but I still think that the solution is not to kill because it's, it just kind of adds on to the violence and it's just fixing violence with, with more violence. Um, so that's one of the one of the um, aspects that I wanted to talk about, and and I think it's it's an interesting um, point of view from from a victim of these people um, to be kind of respecting their human rights and 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 advocating for their human rights instead of just you know being angry and and wanting uh, worse things for them, um, and. Also, the corruption tied with with all this, 
Um, there's this image. I have this. Uh, it's a book dummy. I'm looking to to make the the project into a book, and this is like a dummy. And I'll kind of show you a few of the images of the book. This is the only image that is um, kind of staged, and it's an image of uh, 1,000 quetzales. That's the Guatemalan currency. It's equivalent to around 125 dollars, and the reason I staged this is because of a story that my grandfather told me that um, around, I think, 1997, 1998, they captured, uh, I think, three of or two of the of the abductors of that participated in my abduction. Um, and the and the police called my grandfather and they said, hey, we just trapped these two guys that kidnapped your son and your and your grandson. Um, if you give us a thousand quetzales for each one of them, we'll just kill them on the spot. And so that you evade trial and you get vengeance and we make some money and everybody wins, you know? And my grandfather quickly and very firmly said, no, we're gonna do it the correct way. We're gonna go to trial and, and do all this. So I, I think this, this photograph is very powerful and it, it talks about all these, how it works in Guatemala. And in the research, I spoke to other members of the government that, that were somehow part of this. And they, they um, admitted to, to, um, to, to some torture and some, um, I forget the word, like, unauthorized like yeah torture and, and 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 stuff like this to get more information to where are the other um criminals you know where are the other members of your of your group so that was already you know eye-opening for me like how is this guy just confessing these things to me you know and yeah so that's other things that go with the project um, and another thing is that when in the last day of me being in Guatemala doing this project, always my main goal was to uh, meet one of the kidnappers and kind of have a conversation with them and, and try to see why these things happen in Guatemala, how we can prevent it and all these things like that. And so I was able to meet the leader of the kidnappers, his name was Jose Luis Barahona Castillo. I had to bribe my way into um, a jail known as El Infiernito, also known as Little Hell in English. And I was able to bribe my way in. And of course, it's, it's a very um, different type of uh, jail system as in the US. Like there, the inmates are dressed in civilian clothes and, and it's just like, they're kind of in a space and they're just free to roam and there's uh, restaurants in there and barber shops and it's just kind of their own little world that they can uh, live in. And as a visitor, you just kind of get put in there. You, you don't, they don't call anybody, they, they don't escort you or anything. You just kind of go in and you have to find whoever you're going to visit and 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 that's it so i was able to go in and i met a, the leader of them um of the um, of the group and i sat down with him i documented this because i couldn't bring my camera or anything so i had to kind of take as many things as i could so i found him in the back of the jail and he had a little store there um, where he would sell sodas and snacks and stuff like this. And so I met him. I first lied about my name because I was so nervous. And eventually he knew I was nervous. He's like, sit down. He had a little table next to his shop. He's like, sit down here, have a Coke. And I, I took the Coke and I photographed it, you know, and as a kind of a trophy, you know, <laughs> that I survive that and I sat with him drank this coke and just had a conversation and then I kind of told him directly what my name and he immediately recognized me he remembered me he asked about my father which he was um in the abduction with me and 
he and I, we had this whole conversation, you know, why do these things happen in Guatemala and how can we um, help kind of halt this or, or fix this a little bit? And he said, you know, there's many factors, of course, the, but the obvious factors of necessity and stuff like this. But he said, there's also this very important factor of the, the wealth gap is so big in Guatemala. It's like, you're either poor or you're very rich. And, and so the rich people are always flaunting all this money. So that angers them, you know, and, and the high society is usually very um, mean and like rude to the to poorer people. And so this causes this anger that they, they want to take stuff from them, you know, and, and, and rob them and, and kidnap them and stuff like this. So it's, it's in part that it's in part necessity and all these things. And then all these people, like I said, it, they're kind of um, killed um, by the police in like non uh, without trial and stuff like this. So that's one of the things that I really wanted to talk about. And then once I was in the prison, I met a lot of mothers and, and, and fathers and family members of other inmates that were in, in the gangs. And that's another subject that um, it interests me a lot is, is gangs. And, and the gangs in Guatemala are very big. There's a lot of gangs and people in Guatemala just see them as like, just get rid of them, just kill all of them and just kind of wipe them out. And I, um, I stand very strong against this because a lot of these kids don't want to be there. They're abandoned by their parents. They move to the US to, to try to send them some money and, and make a better life for them. And they have no other option like than to join these gangs and, and, and take part of this. They don't have education. They don't have parents. They don't have any money. They don't have any attention or love. So they are subject to, to join these gangs and, and then the, everybody just wants to kill them and, and try to fix this problem with more violence. And all these things are um, in, in my book uh, that I want to kind of um, touch and, and start conversations about. Well, Luis, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. And yeah, a good, uh, another good example of how we can connect with the past but just not just with the past, but also with the present, which involves mm -hmm. a lot of questions uh, right now. Well, we have like less than 10 minutes. I just would like to make a final question regarding your presentations. Uh, I would like to start with Professor Francis. I think that there are many overlaps and cohesions between the fields of the arts and the human rights. Both basically are concerned with questions of what is or what is not humanity, dignity, identity, and communicating, communication and communicating empathy as well of the transformations of lives, of visions for the future and the mission of the mankind of the full development of the person. Uh, both at the end are universally applicable, but there is like a great deal of sure a space between the disciplines, but how it should be captured and used more consistently in order to push forward with mutually beneficial agendas in both, five, in both fields. I think that uh, Valerie Cambi is a good example, but I would like to know maybe a little bit more about that, like more examples, because I will say that maybe human rights and sometimes the arts actually raise a key question. How do we make the future more attractive than what now exists? So maybe Professor Francis, if you can just share your thoughts on this. Are you muted? Yeah, in the piece yeah. that I'm writing now, Arts of Catastrophe, uh, I've identified a whole range of ways that uh, art practices, uh, often in conversation with other, not only other academic dif disciplines in the humanities, uh, or social sciences, but other practices altogether, like agriculture, um, uh, you know, architecture, uh, many others. So a, a broad, very broad range of forms of knowledge, I would say. Um, and, and I would say that they work very differently, you know? So some, sometimes these uh, artistic interventions uh, create what the future could be, 
uh, already. And that's actually what Valerie Cambio tries to do, try to do is just like, let's provide an environment to experience an embodied experience of what would it feel to be in this different form of economy defined in a different way. If we think about the example I gave of Cine Solar in Arjuntas, what they're, what they're trying to do is creating space where uh, solar, solar powered infrastructure that's profoundly intertwined with the mission of presenting the arts as spaces for dialogue and reflection and collective action can take place along the way, uh, uh, alongside the production of new subjects to create new worlds, right? Um, in other instances, the artistic interventions have to do with communicate information that not, might not be available or counter information. Uh, so for instance, there is a, a group called Colectivo La Puerta uh, and part of their work is that they generate alternative headlines for the news. So uh, identifying the news as a source of often misinformation, but at least aligned with uh, the you know, capitalist, neoliberal capital and colonial uh, rule in, in many ways. So they uh, uh, read the news and then they uh, generate new headlines to understand what was said, right? Um, and then you also have uh, functions that uh, like mourning, uh, Ruti was talking about uh, mourning uh, and grief uh, and grievances. Uh, there are also um, uh, projects that are, are recognizing and, and providing spaces for grief, grievance, and mourning to take place in order to be able to think about the next step. Because it, one, of the, one of the reasons that I feel it took several years for people to uh, protest what had been happening was that people were grieving and they were uh, traumatized and they were not in a position to um, organize yet. Uh, but one, but and the arts had a huge role in moving people to that place, right? Providing space, sites, vocabularies. I mean, one of the one of the things that uh, that I didn't mention that that was very impressive. Like I've been making films since 1989. You know, I've made a, a number of films, and and I've seen some of them have some impact. But one of the things that I was so impressed by Valori Cambio's ability by creating an opportunity to participate in sight of something, not just see something, but participate, was that uh, in a period of about 48 hours, I saw how I would enter a space asking or requesting something and had to explain what a community currency was, what a just economy was, uh, et cetera to not having to because the press had covered it extensively and in a small uh, country like Puerto Rico where people were looking more or less at the same uh, news. Um, and then walking into spaces where I no longer had to explain and people were now using this other vocabulary uh, to articulate visions for the future. I've never experienced that in my entire career as an artist. Uh, and, and immediately implementing um, or, or finding ways to frame what they were thinking of with this other vocabulary, adapting them, sharing it, and so forth. So I would say that it's not a single way, just in, to sum it up, and not a single way that the arts do this, but in a multiplicity of ways in tandem and in dialogue with other practices, uh, not all of which are um, intellectual, academic, um, located, you know? Yeah, it's not a single way, definitely. Thanks, Professor. Ruti, when I was listening to your presentation, I was wondering that maybe the arts question or give frames of what it is to be, what, yeah, yeah, what it is to be while human rights uh, empower people to be who they are. So human rights provide the protection needed to break out of dogma, opening up possibilities of new thinking. So which are often foreground in art. So how human rights can facilitate the creation of spaces for artists and art to engage and, and flourish at the end? I would like to, to hear more about your, your opinion on this. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Really fascinating conversation. Uh, uh, so I would say that for, to my mind, what the arts um, can do is relativize in a way this term human rights, especially in a global moment, because human rights is generally seen as, uh, as um, a claim against the state, okay? And it's the protector is the state. And of course, 
In Latin America, we saw the state turned on its people. And so then, and that happens in other places in the world as well. But that was the, this is, was the central core violation of the social contract, right? The state turned. So this is why in Argentina, the, the, the mothers and the activists keep always talk about the trials um, as human rights trials. They keep going back to that, that the state is, owes them and the state has to, you know, has to address this. I think, you know, now, um, you know, we're talking uh, uh, decades after these events, for example, the disappearances in Latin America that, you know, started this conversation of the need for transition. It kind of interacts with Luis's presentation also, this question of abduction and who's, and presence, who's present, who's, you know, that he discovered they were present, not gone, right, but they were also still, they're abducted, right, they're in that, in that, yeah, it's a it's a mass space, but I'd love to interact more with Luis once your book comes out. That would be very cool. I had a lot of thoughts about that. But anyway, I think the key is to produce space, right? Spaces for this kind of engagement in a in a less formal way than the courts necessarily do, because in the courtroom you really are uh, making claims vis-a-vis uh, -vis the state. Now there are activists now and uh, scholars of different disciplines that have. Uh, 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 created a set of principles, for example, on memory, where the state has an obligation to preserve memories, but the memories are produced uh, through film, right? Inca in Argentina, through uh, writing. And so the state can play a role in, in helping to um, create these spaces when it's necessary to have them in a physical way, right? Like uh, theaters, uh, archives, uh, protecting digital, digitization of, the, of memory, that's happening now, for example, in Argentina and in Chile. So that's a, a, an example, I think of it, but there are of course many more, right? But so I think, you know, we need to think seriously about what kind of engagement do we want between the state and non-state actors? I don't think this is easy. And let me just throw a, a wrap up by saying that in Argentina, they, there's a very close relationship between the state and these, mem and these human rights actors. They're, they are working in tandem. And the risk there is co-optation. In other parts of the world, it's much more contestation between the state and the non-state actors, the private actors. And so this is, but there's no easy answer here, right? Uh, I think it's a dilemma and a tension that we need to be aware of if, if, we're, if we're trying to produce more spaces and have engagement and there's scarcity of resources, right? Which all of the speakers spoke about, yeah. Thank you so much for, for that idea. Luis, I was uh, so shocked when you, was, when you were sharing your story because I, I thought that, okay, maybe much of the human rights um, agenda is basically directed at, at facing with these parities such as preconceptions that we have based on race, religion, gender, age, nationality, and culture or identity. But for from your perspective as an artist, how the art can help to overcome those barriers and bringing like a counter discourse or contesting this privileged narrative and perspective that, that you were mentioned in, in Pasaco 1986, like a project. I, I would like to maybe if you can explore a little bit more of that idea because I, I was so curious about that. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the arts are, are such a good tool for um, human rights activism and, and to speak all these subjects because I think the arts are very democratic in a way. Everybody can kind of enjoy seeing a painting, seeing a photograph, seeing a film, and it's at least for me, it's so much easier to understand things like that. I'm a very visual person, so I can listen to a lecture and not understand as much as if I watch a documentary about something or go to an exhibition that speaks about um, brutality against women or something like this. It helps me so much more to understand. So I think that's kind of, um, one of the, the best examples of that. And also as for me is my easiest way of communication is through my work. It's, it's hard for me sometimes to, to speak on, on these things or to write down on these things. But when I act upon it and, and, and create a film or create a, a, a photographs or something like this, it's easier for me to communicate. So I think it gives it 
a lot of artists platform to to speak on their ideas and, and stuff like this. Thank you, Luis. Well, we have much more, more time, but I don't know if there is an idea or a final comment that someone wants to share. I just had a small thing to do about the state. Um, because in the case of Puerto Rico and other places in the world, um, arts come in because the state is absent <laughs> uh, or neglectful uh, or, um, I mean, not that it's, I mean, not that it's totally absent obviously, but that it's not, uh, it's violating the social contract in a different way than let's say human rights violations. Like for instance, in the case uh, after Hurricane Maria that the state did not uh, deliver supplies, even when they had the supplies, they didn't deliver them, right? Uh, so in that context, I just wanted to add something I didn't mention in my in my presentation, but it is it is part of a, a long, longer version of this um, reflection uh, is also um, the role of the arts as building infrastructure that the uh, the state is not providing. And in Puerto Rico, a lot of these practices, not only the art practices, but other practices as well, have come under the rubric of autogestion, which is obviously not a concept that was uh, invented there, but that uh, many artists are involved in autogestion projects that use the art in some ways, uh, in, ma in many ways, as I've noted, uh, to um, provide services, create spaces, uh, and an education that is not being provided by the state at all. Or minimally, I wanted to add on that um, because there there is um, I feel like the arts are there's a way to kind of be incognito and speak of things against the government or against uh, civil uh, human rights atrocities and stuff like this. There's artists and spaces and th and things like this that work um, on the subject of uh, LGBTQ plus community in, in like Russia and things like this, where it's kind of, there's so many bad things going on with that community. And in the art world, they can kind of speak about it and the government just doesn't know about these places, these artists and these like things. And also they share their work on online. Uh, also in China, it happens a lot. Um, there's this very important artist, Ai Weiwei, that he speaks a lot against um, atrocities that China makes and he speaks on it and a lot of things I think the government just doesn't understand what he's saying when in reality he's really like attacking them and stuff like this so I think it's it's a way to like a Trojan horse that can speak in the country about against the government. Then there's one I mean now, now you made me think about another thing which is very important to say which is um, that it's not I think it, it, the conditions shift and the art strategies have to shift. So for instance, for about 10 years, those murals were holding, were saying there's people that live here and we're not gonna be expropriated, dispossessed by the hedge funds and finance capital and hold luxury condominiums. But after about a decade of very successful art practice in that area, now, if you go to Lonely Planet, they offer you a tour to go there. So now those practices might no longer be the effective um, wall that they were, uh, you know, 10 years ago. And now you might need to, uh, you know, rethink what kinds of practices, uh, given the altered relations of power on the ground that would uh, continue to have that effect to ward off finance capital and dispossessing people of their homes, you know. Yeah, so I would just add that uh, what, what everyone's saying is, and it gets back, of course, to the social construction of, of, of reality. And the question here then would be, what, what does art add to that social construction? And obviously, it, it, we're, we're seeing that it can be a very successful alternative discourse and alternative set of practices. In Argentina, the issue is that the state has appropriated uh, the, certainly the legal side. So I think it's very interesting. There's great Argentine film and other alternative discourses. So sometimes the space for critique can actually close. You know, I'm not saying that China, I wanna go live in China or in Russia, right? But, but, but you, you do have these vital moments, right? For the art communities when, when the state is, is, is corrupt or absent as, as, uh, as Francis said. So it's just an interesting aspect of, of you know, the Argentine um, kind of branding of the state uh, at, at, under the Peronist, under, generally it's more of the left, yeah. 
Well, what can I say? What a fantastic conversation. Uh, many ideas, new questions uh, are coming right now to my mind, but I will say that maybe we need like a, a second or third panel just to discuss all that we want. Once again, thank you very much for your participation. Incredible perspective, different angles to the same conversation, which is at the end a new conversation. And well, uh, I hope to that you enjoy this panel and just I would like to maybe learn more about the projects and then just try to change ideas uh, maybe later. So, well, once again, thank you very much for your participation. Thank you and great to thank meet you. everyone.